In our previous lecture, we introduced natural law theory and examined sex through its lens and the lens of Kantian ethics. We also informed our discussion with some insights from Amiya Srinivasan's book, The Right to Sex. In this lecture, we'll continue in the same way, evaluating what utilitarianism and Aristotelian virtue ethics might say about sex. In the end, and in future lectures, we'll analyze the difficulties of determining what sex is and what it could be for ourselves. Unlike Aquinas and Kant's, the utilitarian moral lens can't identify any individual sex act as either moral or immoral without some kind of context. Like any other act, on this view, the sex act's moral characterization depends on its consequences, specifically that it produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people. It doesn't matter whether the act is premarital, heterosexual, homosexual, anal, oral, vaginal, or with or without contraception or masturbation or anything. However, this doesn't mean that every sex act is always good. Indeed, acts that involve assault or underage participants lead to more harm than can be justified by any amount of pleasure these crimes produce. Even though it's a maximizing theory, neither are utilitarians committed to having sex all day every day since there are other things people can do with their lives that can lead to greater amounts of happiness for greater numbers of people. In further contrast to Aquinas and Kant, on the utilitarian view, heterosexual sex within marriage can be morally wrong if it's mere perfunctory sex coerced or a reluctant spousal duty when any other activity could bring about a greater amount of pleasure. What's more, multiple partners and even adultery may be morally acceptable on this view. If a married couple decides to spice things up by opening their bed to extramarital partners and it brings them closer together, then there appears to be more pleasure created for a greater number of people. Our text also has us consider someone who isn't interested in monogamy or is too busy for the attention long-term relationships require to maintain. This person may end up being happier with multiple casual sex partners, or hiring sex workers at their leisure. Even though Mill's account of utilitarianism differs from Bentham's in that it can account for higher and lower order pleasures, in the context of sex, it seems like either type of utilitarian would be able to naturally decide for themselves which sex acts would be higher or lower than others. Since there's little consensus among virtue theorists regarding sexual ethics, our text stops instead to view these questions through the framework established so far. Recall that the virtue theorist answers moral course of action questions by first asking another question. That is, what would a virtuous person do in this situation? There's room for the occasional lapse in judgment on this theory. This appears to be a strength of this view, since we do encounter otherwise good and virtuous people who will, however, seldomly do something out of character. A virtuous person is one who's developed dispositions to act in the right way, at the right time, to the right extent, and for the right reasons. However, individual acts can be morally characterized on their own, to the extent that they correspond to a vice or virtue. To discover virtuous actions requires developing these dispositions through the application of Aristotle's doctrine of the mean, because acting between excesses and deficiencies in situations is to act rationally. Since our function as humans is reason, acting rationally is acting virtuously. If we repeatedly avoid excessive and deficient actions, we'll come to recognize what is intermediate and rational more easily and respond in the right way and more regularly. To illustrate this, our text gives the example of fear. Being excessively fearful and acting so is cowardice, and being deficiently fearful is rash, or foolhardiness. However, to be reasonably fearful, that is, intermediate, is to be courageous. With regard to sex, our text identifies temperance as the key virtue and proposes the rough interpretation, moderation. I've argued previously that conscientiousness may be the most appropriate interpretation of temperance. However, since conscientiousness entails moderation, there's no real problem to continue using our text interpretation of it. 
Temperate people will not overeat, nor will they starve themselves, and they won't drink to blackout, nor will they abstain from the pleasures of alcohol entirely. Temperate people have developed dispositions that show them what is rational and intermediate with regard to pleasures, so they're more efficient in recognizing virtuous courses of action. Therefore, temperate people will not be driven by sexual desire to the point that it becomes harmful, nor will they abstain from sex completely. Rather, they'll have the right amount of sex with the right people, at the right times, and for the right reasons. Temperate people won't compromise their sexual health with the wrong partners, nor compromise their modesty by having sex for the wrong reasons, nor will they compromise their goals by having sex at the wrong times. Our text concludes this section with the few points of agreement that do exist among virtue theorists regarding sexual ethics. Rape, for example, is always morally wrong. On this view specifically, justifications could include the injustice of violating a person and the injustice of violating their sexual autonomy to decide when, how, and with whom they have sex. Pedophilia is wrong for all the same reasons. Adultery would also be morally wrong on this view, since it involves breaking marriage vows because we're overwhelmed by sexual desire. For the sake of practice with this lens, let's look at the last example of adultery in the context of courage. Imagine a happily married person is given the opportunity to have sex with the most attractive person they can imagine. In this situation, there are many possibilities for viciousness. We could go astray through lust or lying, but we'll look at the vices of cowardice and rashness. Either of these vices can lead us to disregard our marriage to pursue this intimate encounter. If we're rash, the vice of excess, we may rush into it without considering the consequences it could have for ourselves and for our spouses. On the other extreme, we may agree to the encounter fearing the pain of missing out on the experience, making us cowards, the vice of deficiency. But if we're virtuous, we'll have the courage to face the pain of missing out and consider the consequences of our actions before rushing into the encounter. On the whole, none of these moral lenses are perfect, but virtue ethics seems to be a promising theory, at least in the context of sex. Unfortunately, we didn't make it to the right to sex this time. I'm breaking up the material because there's just too much of it for one lecture. So that's where we'll pick up next time when we analyze some moral questions surrounding pornography and sex work. There are a lot of strong feelings and opinions out there on these topics, but let's try to be as impartial as we can and understanding. Try to understand why people would hold these often opposing views. Indeed, as we'll see in the next few lectures, there are many things to consider in sex-related questions.